Welcome everyone. My name is Sabah Merchant and I lead operations for our learning programs at Tech Tech. So it, delighted to welcome each of you to our Future of Work conference. Over the next two days, our guest experts will show you the tools and techniques needed to create a resilient and sustainable organization for social change and as well as methods in order to create a more equitable sector. Let's move on to our lovely first session and our lovely uh, speaker here, Beth. Um, our session today is beginning from exhausted to energized, centric well-being in the way you work. And I'd like to introduce Beth. A wonderful speaker, Beth, is an award-winning author, and she's the author of Happy Health Nonprofit. And today, we are graced by her presence. She's going to walk us through her presentation, and then we will leave time at the end for questions. I'm sure you've taken the time to look over our agenda for today. And for those who are just joining in, we're going to start our session with Beth Cantor. She is an internationally recognized Thought leader in digital trans transformation and well being in the nonprofit workplace. She's also the co author of Happy Healthy Nonprofit Impact Without Burnout and the Smart Nonprofit. Named one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company and recipient of the N10 Lifetime Achievement Award, she has over three decades of experience in designing and delivering training programs for nonprofits and foundations. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here. And great to see people from so many different places. And I'm gonna be talking, sharing some high level research on workplace well-being, and of course, many practical tips on how you can refuel and also create a culture of caring and resilience as you do your organization's work together. And just a note, if you want the slides or dig into the many resources and research highlights I'll be sharing, take note of that bit.ly URL. It includes my slides, handouts, and links to different articles. And of course, you'll get a copy of that after the session as well. Um, so almost 10 years ago, when I was researching my third book, The Happy Healthy Nonprofit, we interviewed thousands of nonprofit leaders about burnout and workplace well-being. And we learned, and this was pre-pandemic, that working at a nonprofit was not a walk on the beach, exactly. And one executive director said something that really struck with me. And th they said, why does something extreme have to happen before nonprofit leaders change and start to take well-being seriously? And we heard many stories about nonprofit staff literally working themselves to death, ending up in the, in the hospital, some leaving on a gurney, and all of this because of their, their commitment and passion to the organization's mission. And this passion that we feel in the nonprofit sector to our missions, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it helps us keep going in the face of difficult challenges. And on the other hand, we can be so driven that we don't stop to refuel or even notice that we're burning out. And this is simply not sustainable. And I think this cartoon really sums it up. It's from the book. You see an executive director or maybe it's a development director or in the or they've hooked him up some chest pains or something, and they hooked him up to a heart monitor. The doctor's leaning over, and he's saying, grant deadline on Thursday. <laughs> and so really, passion is this double-edged sword, and it's simply not sustainable. Fast forward to the pandemic, and we're finally beginning to realize that working without refueling and taking time off is a fast track to burnout. And what you're seeing on the screen there is the World Health Organization's definition of burnout. And burnout is the, is the state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion that occurs um, when we feel overwhelmed by too many demands and too few resources. And before the pandemic, the, the World Health Organization designated that burnout was a organizational responsibility, that it wasn't the fault of the inter in individual, and that as part of the organizational responsibility for guarding against employee burnout, 
they needed to address well-being and wellness and encourage work-life balance and make sure that staff are building strong relationships. And that's really important for getting work done. It's not just soft stuff. Clarity of job descriptions, fair treatment at work, a sustainable workflow, flexibility, and having employees really engage in meaningful work. And again, um, burnout is an organizational responsibility, and it's not the fault of the individual employee. And you have to bear in mind that burnout comes with a high cost. Burnout's expensive. <laughs> So according to Gallup research, 63% of employees who are burnt out are more likely to take a sick day. That adds up in costs. They are 2.6 more likely to be actively seeking a different job. We're seeing that right now with the great resignation or the great reshuffling. And then there is a 13% reduction in performance goals. They're not doing their best work for your organization. So that's burnout pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has really accelerated burnout everywhere and especially in the nonprofit sector. And if we reflect for a moment, we've been living and working through a global pandemic, racial inequities, natural disasters due to climate change, war, rising inflation, this in food insecurity and a demand for more services and many other external circumstances that have contributed to this uncertainty that we're living in and, of course, have helped accelerate burnout. And some nonprofit staff, some of you may have been working on the front line since the pandemic, trying to work safely, and others faced an overnight transition back in 2020 to becoming a remote distributed team and having to, like, like master online collaboration in, in a short amount of time or go miles ahead in your digital transformation. And, and working from home normalized a, work, a longer work day, and that's continued beyond the shutdown. We're working more. And then we've had the COVID whiplash, return to the office, work from home, return to the office, and grappling with embracing different hybrid and flexible models while trying to rebuild social capital with other staff, especially staff that was hired during the pandemic and our partners and the people we serve. All the while learning to live with COVID and the sort of fear of, of infection. So not surprisingly, workplace burnout is soaring globally, according to McKinsey data. And in the nonprofit sector, 30% say they are burned out, with 60% of leaders saying they feel used up at the end of the day. Employees <clears throat> across the board are evaluating their jobs, careers, lives, and this has been fueling that great resignation. And organizational leaders who are left behind, they're left with that stress of filling positions and an increased workload. So we're really, I think, facing a human capital crisis in the nonprofit sector. And the path forward is that we have to lead with well-being. What I've just said, <laughs> I have to ask, how are you doing? All right. How exactly are you doing? And, and I want to do, hopefully, yes, it's working. I'm going to do a quick Slido poll and just give me a few words on how you're doing. Just three words. And you can go to it. Just open up another tab, slido.com. And the co event code is TS-Beth. That's a dash. It doesn't matter whether it's capitalized or not. And just share three words about how you're doing. So just give that a second. And I've been asking this question throughout the pandemic, variations of this question, and really thing to see what pops up. Okay, exhausted, <laughs> stress, and it pop over to my bigger screen. Although it's not across the board negative, there are some people feeling engaged, happy, but I see a lot of tired, undervalued, stressed, hanging in there, roller coaster of emotion, exasperated, overcooked. <laughs> that's, an, that's one I haven't seen, sad, so a swirl here of different emotions and um, it, and in these different emotions, a few positive, but mostly a few negative emotions. And I'm going to switch now to another chart that shows how other people are feeling. And this comes from United Health Foundation. And this is a report about social isolation during the pandemic. And they asked people how they were feeling. And adults in general have experienced mainly negative emotions during the pandemic. As you can see, some similar words are popping up there at the top, frustrated, stressed, anxious, and isolated. So you're not alone. Uh, and, and that means we, it's okay not to be okay. And the pandemic has really been rough and we have to acknowledge this. And according to recent World Health Organization data, 
that just came out last month. The pandemic has triggered a 25% increase in anxiety and depressing, uh, depression worldwide. And so just like Olympians, um, Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, who opened up about their mental health challenges, we need to take that stigma away from openly talking about mental health issues. So it's important for you and your staff to, to make sure that, you know, what we normalize talking about it and that it's okay. And, and that staff have the support they need and access to employee assistance program resources and more. And finally, I have to say that it's okay for you to put yourself at the top of your to-do list and prioritize your own well-being. I also want to note that that mental health epidemic that we're experiencing, it's just like COVID. It's on a continuum of, of symptoms from mild to severe. And the severe side, we have the burnout, the depression, the anxiety. On the less severe side, we have something that's just, it's been dubbed by Adam Grant called languishing. <laughs> and it just means feeling blah, a lack of motivation. It's, it isn't burnout because we still have energy to do work. It isn't depression because we don't feel hopeless and we're getting dressed, we're getting up out of bed. Um, we just feel somewhat joyless. So language, languishing is this sort of sense of stagnation and emptiness. And it feels as if you're muddling through your days, looking at your life through a foggy windshield. And this too can impact organizations as well. When we, so there has been an increased attention across the board from organizations to look at you know, solving the burnout puzzle. And and McKinsey recently did a study to better understand the disconnection between employer effort to address burnout and rising employee burnout. Like, why aren't all these efforts working? And what they found is that uh, the factors that most contribute to burnout and to the subsequent great resignation are the three top ones are workplace behavior, negative interpersonal experiences, such as unfair treatment at work, exclusion of coworkers, and lack of support and communication from managers. That topped the list. Second is unsustainable workload, scheduling, lack of flexible scheduling, lack of encouraging work-life balance, and also inclusion, organizational sy systems and leaders who foster a welcoming and fair environment for all employees and connect them to meaningful work. And so, the disconnect is that a lot of well-being really focuses on individual employee resilience and adaptability skills, um, and that alone does not solve burnout. They are, it's an important piece of the puzzle, but a big piece of it is workplace culture. And there's a third piece, too, and it has to deal with leadership. Employee burnout is really a leadership issue as well. And according to the most recent Gallup workplace search, at the beginning of the pandemic, People, leaders were really paying attention to the well-being of their employee and employees felt cared about, right? And as this uh, pandemic has dragged on, pe people are feeling less and less like their leadership cares about them. And that also contributes to this burnout and also to the great resignation. So employee well-being is crucial to organizational health. And it's something that leaders can't ignore, not only for their employees, but also for themselves as well. So that's like the Debbie Downer portion of the, the presentations, the research, the like hot off the press research about uh, workplace well-being and kind of the state of burnout. So I want to shift now to some tips and uh, practical tips and solutions to this. They aren't all easy to execute on because a lot of, as we said, some of it is changing our personal behavior. Some of it is workplace culture and some uh, is leaders uh, behavior. So let's uh, look at some of the tips. So my first tip is cultivate empathy. All right. So I, at the beginning of this, asked you how you were doing. <laughs> That's being empathetic. And you want to, as much as possible, in encourage people to listen, identify, and proactively ask about and listen to people's well-being needs. Have a well-being pulse checks and incorporate feedback questions and broader voice surveys. Put well-being topics on the agenda at staff meetings and board meetings and leadership meetings. It doesn't have to be the whole entire meeting, but, but some time needs to be allocated. It's not something that we can simply ignore, and that's not part of cultivating empathy. And also, many of you do one-on-ones, uh, assuming either you're checking in with a manager or uh, they're checking in with you. One-on-one -on -one should not be about like, hey, where's that report or where's that deliverable? Yes, uh, checking in about work is important, but we also need to check in about how 
people's energy and the work environment. And especially if you're still to, to virtual, the checking in for loneliness and things like that and how and workflow and manageable workloads, really checking in with people is really important. So cultivating a sort of culture of empathy by uh, caring and checking in. The next is centering fairness at work and fair, a high degree of fairness in a work environment is one where employees feel that their manager and their organization treat them fairly. And it's threaded into everything your organization does from who you're hiring to how you facilitate meetings to how you conduct your one-on-ones and so forth. And if you look here, this is a Gartner study uh, that just came out a little while ago uh, that found that only 18% of employees say they work in a high fairness environment and have an employee experience that's characterized as fair. So employees that work at high fairness environments perform at a, at a better level, uh, 26% uh, higher than those who don't, and they're 27% like, less likely to quit. Lack of fairness is something that especially impacts employees who are people of color and women, according to the future form data that you see on the right. And another area of fairness is the language we use in our organization. Words matter and making sure that your organization's documents, policies, and the way speak people are speaking to each other includes inclusive language to ensure a fair access. Overall, addressing fairness and inclusion helps with well-being, according to the Gartner research. 64% boost in the ability to manage stress and a 25% um, improvement in work-life balance. So asking the right questions, listening, and measuring well-being. I know uh, this might seem like a radical concept, but we really need to set a metric around well-being that's just as important as fundraising metrics. And I know people are draws are dropping when I say that, because what gets measured gets done. And a couple of ways to do this, what you're looking at is a uh, burnout assessment uh, that is in the Happy Healthy Nonprofit. And this helps at an individual level, helps uh, employees understand burnout. But when you aggregate this at an organizational level anonymously, you get a sense of you know, what is the overall level of burnout and where are the times where the organization is experiencing it? so you can make adjustments. It's also important to get anecdotal feedback from employees in their own words. And if you're a leader, to be making sure that you're listening to them and not only listening, but doing some action, if you will. This transparency will go a long way. It, burnout's just not a problem that we can just ignore because if we ignore it, it gets worse and people get frustrated and people leave. And, and we all know what it's like to have to fill positions. For those of you who are executive directors or leading teams, I just want to say a word here about your leadership behavior is contagious and no fun there. And really recognize your own role in stress collation, right? Are you emailing after hours? Are you setting unrealistic deadlines? Are you being fair in the way that you're assigning work? You want to really recognize that. You want to amplify and celebrate well-being behaviors. And you also want to value and protect your time away. You want to model work-life balance. So employees, if you're the leader, employees will feel like, okay, this is okay. This is something that we need to do. Radical prioritization. We got to rethink productivity. And I know Allison Fine and will talk a lot about our second book, The Smart Lot Nonprofit, and talk about some technical solutions as well as leadership solutions to that. But what I've heard around the country when I talk about this is that unsustainable workload is the biggest contributor to a lot of nonprofit to this burnout. People are just doing too much, right? And part of that is self-inflicted, that we feel like we have to do a thousand percent for it to be good. Some of it may be inflicted by funders <laughs> and some of it being inflicted because of a rise in demand for services and, and maybe short, being short staffed. But we really need to rethink prioritization and not having to do everything on the list, right? But really prioritizing. And I love this little framework. It's called the three Ds. <laughs> so while you're doing something, you want to pause before you do and reflect. Can you delegate this? Can someone else do it? Can another department do it? Can you delete it? Do you, is it really necessary at all? Can we delay it? Can this be done next week? Does it have to be done right now? Is it that urgent? Or can we diminish? Does it have to be the perfect version of something? Can we streamline it? How do we simplify? 
So rethinking your productivity is not getting a thousand percent done, but really prioritizing radical prioritization on what needs to be done and paying attention to those unsustainable workloads. And again, Allison will tell, talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in tomorrow morning's session about the smart nonprofit. Getting calmer work norms. And work norms are standards of behavior for how work is done. And everybody understands how to interact with others. And there's no assumptions. There's an old saying that if we make assumptions, we make an ass of you and me. And this is particularly important. I think the thing that contributes to stress is the way that we connect with people around urgent or non-urgent response times. And this manifests a lot with uh, people slacking or texting or emailing at all times, and there's no boundaries around work, but having explicit conversation about this and actually having written norms about what is the expected response time to something and you know, what is something, you know, when is something truly urgent and when can it wait? Not everything is an emergency. So Again, I think technology in some ways can be a culprit to this. After hours, emailing, slacking, texting, this contributes to having a lack of boundaries between work and life. We don't feel like we're getting a break at all. And in Portugal, it's illegal to text after hours. And in France, it's illegal to send emails after hours. And I'm not talking about emergency work. I know that's separate. But everybody should learn how to use the send later button. We may be working at odd hours because of the flexibility of the of a hybrid model and what that offers us. But but it doesn't necessarily mean we need to send it after hours because uh, that creates stress for people. And, um, and if you've created this culture where everybody's working all the time by replying all and replying to emails, that leads to burnout. So learn how to use the reply all button and have an after hours for non emergency work, email, texting, Slack policy. The next is this opportunity to rethink meetings. Uh, we have so many meetings <laughs> that we simply do not have enough time to do the work. And if we don't have time to do the work during the workday because we're in meetings all day without breaks, then we're going to be overworking on nights and weekends. So you really have to think about, should this be a meeting? Could it just have been an email? And also think about who's invited to the meetings, right? Um, who's invited? Um, because when the content of the meeting is not relevant to somebody, especially if they're remote, they're going to try and multitask. And that's also exhausting. So really think about like, who has to come. And then another thing that we, I think we should do is do a recurring meetings purge, all right? And we're coming up to the new year. That's a good time to do it. Take out all those recurring meetings and then only put them back when they become necessary. And, and create a practice where if there is a recurring meeting, and you arrive and there's only 10 minutes of work and the meeting schedule for an hour, don't just meet for the hour, <laughs> Let give people some time back. So those are some things that you can do around workplace culture and uh, avoiding burnout. So I wanna talk about a few things that you can do for yourself. And again, it has to be a both end. We have to address workplace culture and leadership and things that we can do for ourselves. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is in the book, I talked a lot about the triad of wellness, which is sleep, nutrition, and exercise, all right? And everybody's heard this. They've heard this from their doctor. Now you need to eat, eat healthy foods. You need to get a good night's sleep, six to eight hours, and you need to get regular exercise. And sometimes we roll our eyes. Sometimes we pay attention to it. But there's this fourth area emerging, and it's technology wellness. And it, it's really important, especially around having some boundaries around our devices that were and around screen time, because screen time is like the new cancer, if you will. It, you know, it has some implications for our health. I'll, I'll share that in a moment. But we want to be able to set up a routine where we're not on our devices all the time, maybe have a more healthy bedtime routine where we're putting uh, the phone or the screens away for an hour before we go to bed and have a cup of calming tea. And I'll tell you the reason for that is, is this. Blue, the blue light that comes from our screens really impacts our physical health. You may be familiar with all the research that, that blue light is measured in Kelvins and the blue light of our phones and our computer screens is brighter than a sunny day. So if we're looking at our screens right before bed, the light's going in through our eyes and up to our brain and our brain's thinking, oh, it's daylight. And it delays the onset of me melatonin, an important um, 
hormone that allows us to get a good, restful, rejuvenating uh, sleep. And there's actually, uh, and even if you're using that setting in your phone, it's just change it to warm light. There isn't documentation or evidence, scientific evidence that that actually works. And also if you're looking at work email or something right before bed and an emergency email comes in about a big report due unexpected tomorrow morning, oh, that's not going to be a great restful night's sleep. And the third piece that just came, uh, that I just saw a study over the summer from Harvard Medical School is that chronic blue light accelerates aging <laughs> by, by impairing the metabolism. And so that, so in other words, if you spend too much so screen time, you're going to increase the number of wrinkles in your face. Um, the other part is that lack of tech boundaries can impact our mental health. And we've all heard of doom scrolling, which is like endlessly scrolling through social media and news stories that are bad. You know, having to read every single article that's been posted about like what the new COVID variant, that's not healthy either. So we have to like stop that doom scrolling. And uh, what's really fun is that uh, there's a doom scrolling bot that's out on Twitter. And, and it's funny, you can, uh, if you're, if you find yourself doom stro scrolling, you can tweet to it and it'll give you some suggestions for other things that you can do besides doom stroll. I'm not saying don't be informed about the news and, but don't obsess on it and be doing it nonstop. And I know some of you may be communications folks and you have a responsibility to keep on top of the news, but it shouldn't be 24 seven. And if possible, hopefully you can do it in shifts and uh, share that task with others because lack of tech boundaries also impacts your mental health. The other thing is that we need to bust that multitasking myth. We need to single task, okay? There's a high cost to, to multitasking. Uh, we think we're getting stuff done when we have five different tabs open and we're bouncing between our email and writing that report and looking at social. But really what we're teaching ourselves is not to concentrate and to do deep work. And Multitasking is really a myth because we can't, our brains can't do two things at once. We're actually shifting between different tasks. And in that shifting, there's only so much shifting that we can do every day. And that contributes to the exhaustion. So think about single tasking and doing deep work, closing all those tabs. It might take some time for you to retrain your brain to work in that way. But if you do it, embrace single tasking. And I've been through this experience personally. When I've shifted to single tasking, it feels much better. And, and I'm actually doing better quality work. So bust that multitasking miss, myth and single task. And I'm going to go back to this and just say one thing. In order, I asked a bunch of nonprofit folks recently, well, why are you multitasking? And they said, because there's too much to do. There's so much work. And so part of this kind of multitasking piece is coming because of our workload. So we also need to address sustainable workloads as well. Having tech life boundaries or just having work life boundaries can be done with having rituals, right? Buffer times between work and stopping work and a good morning routine is not rolling out of bed and looking at your email in the morning. That is not a great morning uh, routine, but a good morning routine is maybe taking 20 minutes, a half hour, maybe an hour, whatever you can do and have a cup of coffee, journal, plan your day, do some exercise, uh, reading. And when you can take some time for yourself in the morning, it'll set the tone for your day. And you can also do it at the end of the day. And I think this is really important if you're continuing to work from home to have a shutdown ritual, because many of us may not have a special office or separate place in our homes to do our work. Um, I know I'm in that boat too. And if I keep my computer open while I'm in the kitchen trying to like uh, you know, do dinner or just trying to relax and I see my laptop, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to naturally go over to it and check my email or something. So I have a whole ritual of putting away my devices and it signals quit in time. It's, it's time to disengage and take a break. I've talked a lot about the power of networks over the years. I, I wrote a book with Allison Fine called The Network Nonprofit. And, and I've talked a lot about building your professional network. And uh, your professional network is really, it's not about using it to find a job, all that it's helpful for that. But you can also create your professional network as a resilience circle. So creating this sounding board or resilience circle, you know, I make the biggest mistakes when I operate in a vacuum. 
So I have several close uh, colleagues um, that I use as a sounding board be before talking with my clients sometimes or, or editor. Um, and sometimes my sounding board helps me avoid making a mistake in the first place, which leads to stress. Um, or sometimes they can help me bounce back. But bringing that circle of people, of professionals, especially since if we are working part of the time at home and we don't have that camaraderie in the office, this can really help. And the last piece uh, I want to talk about is creating joy, moments of joy in your day. And you know, it's not all, it shouldn't all work, work, work all day long, going from back to back meetings. And during the pandemic, one of the things I did for myself is I put a hummingbird feeder up on the window because watching the hummingbirds drink from it and watching their behavior and watching them fly brought me a lot of joy. And, but then one day this bully arrived, you can see him. And this particular bully was fighting off everybody from every other bird from the hummingbird feeder. It used this little beak like a sword. And, um, and I did some research and I found that if, uh, you could get rid of the bullies. It's part of their natural behavior. But if you put up a lot more feeders, that'll distract the bully because they can't guard all the feeders. So we put up many feeders in our house. So I could take a three minute break away from a Zoom call and just look out the window and watch the hummingbird. So think about what can you do for a couple of minutes during your day that can bring you some joy? <laughs> and that will then bring you energy and renewal. So I've shared the latest uh, research about a, a burnout and workplace well-being. Uh, the important thing to remember that it's a three-pronged strategy. It's organizational cultural issues you need to address. It's a leadership issue, but it's also things that you can do for yourself. And I've given you some practical tips for both uh, workplace culture, leadership, as well as things you can do for yourself. So I will just uh, stop sharing now and see if there's questions or comments. Great. So there's Saba. <laughs> I, was wondering, I wonder if you're going to leave me all alone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry for learning that little... Uh like that all right we do have questions actually so let's start with one what is an example of a good way to phrase a well-being question in a one-on-one -on -one? that that's a great question and on the resources i did uh, connect everybody to a, a fantastic article that gives you lots of examples of different questions but but uh, what comes to mind right away is one could be how's your energy lately how are things how are you doing how are things going for you? Is there anything that I can do as your manager to uh, help with address some of any issues around overload? Uh, what can I do differently? What can we do for you? <laughs> so pretty simple. There's a whole bunch of other questions on this uh, link that's in the materials, but I think that's you know, a good place to start. Great. Don't Great. start with, where's that report? It's late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something very simple as what is working? What's not working? What can I do to help you? Or what can you do to help you? Simple things like that, I think, are good conversation starters and will you know, give you an insight about how your team is really feeling. So thank you for that. All right. Our next question is right here. If employer actually went remote first and flexible work schedules, how does this affect well-being? Second, how many nonprofits are truly distributed? Okay, so if employers actually went remote first and flexible work schedules, uh, how does this affect? Okay, well, let's talk about the Well, remote first, my understanding of that definition is that we're primarily remote, but we do may go into the office at certain points for in-person interaction where uh, in-person real-time communication is important for decision-making or, or getting things done. And I actually have a handout in the materials. There's two things here. It's like understanding digital fluidity. <laughs> So when do we need to be in person and when do we work remotely? And again, for remote first, it'll be more remote work, but there will be those touch points. And then also understanding what should be done in real time or synchronous and what is asynchronous work and get, we're getting really good at that. And what I mean by that, like if like meetings might not all be all about reports, <laughs> Maybe the reports will be distributed as pre-work. People flexibly on asynchronous read through the report, or maybe it's a quick video. And then you come together for a shorter meeting or a sync meeting to actually make those decisions. And you learn how to facilitate interaction with uh, your online collaboration platforms, whether that's um, like Google Docs or whatever. 
instead of spending an hour talking about reviewing and uh, collaborating on a document, you could asynchronously share a draft of the document and have people comment, summarize all the comments and have another short meeting, kind of agree on things. Um, and, and the way that affects well-being is that you're coming together at different points uh, so that there's no assumptions, there's no projections, there's no miscommunication and under misunderstanding. There's also, um, I think when we're remote first, there's newer tools out there. Like there's one called Loom. I don't know if it's one being shown or not, but it's the ability to like click a button and you could explain something in a video instead of right typing out this really long email <laughs> that also helps you get around trying to figure out like, when can we schedule a meeting so we can talk about this? Um, so as much time shifting as you can do can really help with well-being because it will reduce the amount of time we're actually working. Because if you're not doing flexible work in a remote or hybrid situation really well, that leads to overwork. Another thing I did here, and this is related to hybrid work, there is a new research lab that's at Stanford. It's right down the road for me. And they're researching different models of what, which one of the hybrid work models work most effectively. And what they're finding is that top-down models where everybody in the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays, no exceptions, is leading to a lot more stress because what's happened is, is every, the, the people are just cramming in all their meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's leading to overwhelm and to stress. And what they're saying is in the research, they found that it's more effective and, and also contributes to well-being if it's done as a bottom-up. And not everybody choose their own, but it's kind of on a team by team basis of when the team needs to be in person and when they need to go remotely. On the other end of the spectrum, the kind of everybody picks their own adventure, what day they'll be in the office. That's also contributing to some stress because getting people, you know, if people need quick information, they haven't set up those calming norms to figure out best ways to get that. So there's a lot of interruptions or somebody's working from home on a grant proposal, but they don't have access to some information that's in the office. So they have to ask someone. So there's, you know, all of those interruptions. So if you're, if you chose that direction, you really need to look at your digital systems and making sure that people have access to the information they need to do their jobs. Second, I'm not quite sure what the second question is. How many nonprofits are truly distributed? Are, are we talking, you know, if we're talking about distributed across time zones, I mean, that's another issue too that pops up for stress where a time zone where some people feel I, my, my organization's global. So I'm working all the time because I had to be up early for the people from Asia and then up late for the people in Europe. And so I feel like I'm working all the time. Or I'm on the West Coast and I have to get up at 6 a.m. because everybody's on the East Coast for 9 a.m. meetings. So I've been hearing models where people are compensating people who have to work outside of their normal time zone and they try to set some core hours. And, and there's also a lot of tools that can give you good time zone awareness of showing where you can actually see a visual of where people are and um, developing a scheduling and communication sense of when, you know, that other person may be off at off time for them. So that was a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, thank you for taking the time to answer that. I have an interesting question, uh, one that I picked out, which was uh, which came from Nicole. And she asked, how do you best influence a culture of wellness in an established organization where habits and trends may already be developed? I get this question a lot. And as I mentioned before, of, unfortunately, it has to, that has to stop at the, uh, start at the top. It, that is where it is a leadership issue and is the leader is the leader of your organization a modeling a culture of well-being <laughs> or are they modeling a culture of stress and burnout it has to change at the top and leaders need to pay attention to this because what's happening is that people are leaving <laughs> they're changing jobs um, we've heard of the great resignation we've heard of or quiet quitting where people are preserved their boundaries around work and I th really think leaders need to make this connection between well-being and impact. <laughs> There's a connection. I wrote a book about that uh, 10 years ago. I've been talking about this and something extreme happened, the pandemic. So now we really need to center this. Um, change can also happen kind of one team at the time from the bottom up. And also culture change doesn't happen overnight. You have to have a lot of patience. And it's not something that you say, hey, we're going to do it. It's something that you're working on continuously. Great. Thank you. I think uh, 
I think we will start winding down our session and getting ready for our next one. I want to quickly go ahead and share my screen for a quick minute here. All right. Hopefully everyone can uh, see my screen. Thank you, Beth. This was wonderful. I know I truly picked up a lot of important pointers, reminders, uh, quite a few, but I think my most favorite one is quality over quantity. So really thinking about single tasking versus multitasking. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really happy to see you and interact with each of you.